like it was Miller. I teach the philosophy department and I'm the director of the program in ethics and public life. This is the third lecture in our series after the American century, Fears and Hopes for America's Future. Uh, we actually were thinking of a subtitle, Hopes and Fears for America's Future. We decided to put fears first and I think the main reason was the intensity of people's economic worries. People worry about what the chances are that they'll get good jobs. If they have jobs, what the chances are of job security. They worry about whether young people in the United States are going to a more prosperous life than their parents. They worry whether their lives will be as prosperous as their parents. Uh, I don't want to underrate the extent of uh, remaining burdens of the Great Recession, even if it's just a slow recovery. But I think it's right that many, many people wonder, is this just a slow recovery, or is it a new normal economic condition for the United States? I can think of no one who's insights will more brightly illuminate these questions than today's speaker, Richard Freeman, of the Harvard Economics Department. His inquiries into these questions about the lives of working people in the United States and also similar questions about the lives of working people all over the world are amazingly diverse, deeply illuminating, and <coughs> invariably deeply humane. His humane insights into these questions of what shapes working people's lives for better or worse, they really know no bounds in terms of aspects of living as well as in terms of geography. Uh, to tell you more about Richard Freeman's career of insight into people's lives, core economic aspects. Uh, Fran Blau of the Department of Economics will introduce him. And then he will give us a lecture whose title I will now clarify. <laughs> Econocatastrophobia. Uh, let's, you know, let's not analyze. Econocatastrophobia, which involves dissecting American fears of economic decline in the new global economy. Right? Well, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker today, Richard Freeman, the Herbert Asherman Professor of Economics at Harvard, where he is also the co-director of the Labor and Work Life Program at the Harvard Law School. And in addition, he's a senior Professorial Research Fellow of the Center for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics. Professor Freeman is a graduate of a competitor, Dartmouth College, and he received his PhD from Harvard University. After brief stints at Yale and the, Chicago, and the University of Chicago, uh, Richard returned to Harvard where he has spent his academic career. He's the recipient of numerous awards and other professional recognitions. I can only, in the time permitted without encroaching on his whole lecture, just mention a few highlights. Uh, he's received the two highest awards given in labor economics, the ICA Prize for Outstanding Academic Achievement in the Fields of Labor Economics in 2007, and the Jacob, Jacob Mincer Award for Lifetime Contribution to the Fields of La Labor Economics from the Society of Labor Economists in 2006. He's a former president of the Society of Labor Economists and a former vice president of the American Economic Association. He's been named a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and he's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, the Society of Labor Economists, the Labor and Employment Relations Association, and the American Academy of Political and 
social science. Needless to say, I mean, it's really a great privilege uh, to introduce Richard to you. Uh, he is, as a number of Dick's remarks um, suggested, truly a giant in the field of economics. He's, he's one of the preeminent economists of our time. And his long and extremely prolific research career, and you know, we say, use those terms prolific often, but uh, Richard raises that to a, a whole, uh, whole additional level. He's touched on virtually every aspect of labor economics, and he's been extraordinary in, extraordinarily influential, not just in terms of his specific findings, which have often been game-changing, but also in influencing how we economists go about studying uh, labor, uh, the labor market. Indeed, he's been referred to as a founder of modern uh, labor economics. Over and over, Richard asks really big, really provocative questions, as we'll see today. And over and over, he answers them in incredibly convincing, rigorous fashion. Uh, the, ty the type of answers that many of us lesser mor mortals can only bring to smaller, more precise uh, questions. I liked what the ICA committee, prize committee, said uh, about Richard when they did allude to his fundamental contributions that have monumentally shaped modern labor economics. And they went on to say that Richard's work was also important because it extended the range of issues which labor economists study. And this includes attention to very important social problems like inequality, discrimination, crime, and the viability of the welfare state. Uh, Richard's influence has been further increased by his leadership role as longtime director of labor studies at the National Bureau of Economic Research, where he uh, had enormous impact in directing specific projects, inviting specific uh, speakers and encouraging uh, younger people. I have to say it, that I owe him a personal debt as a young assistant professor at Harvard. He was a member of my thesis committee and uh, the shorthand way to say it is that he had enormous value added. He was enormous value added. So uh, what, what has uh, Richard what kind of areas has he eliminated? Uh, too many to mention, but let me hit some highlights. His work on labor unions, uh, where he not only helped us to understand uh, the impact of unions on labor market outcomes and on the economy writ large, but to understand the very, better understand the very nature of unions and what their function is. Uh, he's very influential in being one of the first economists to study the consequences of civil rights legislation for the economic outcomes of those Americans. Uh, his contributions to understanding wage and equality are enormously important. He's pioneered the study of international comparisons of uh, economic outcomes that help us better understand the role of national institutions and national policies on the labor market. And in recent years, as I'm sure it'll be relevant today, he's become increasingly interested in Asian labor markets. So just uh, briefly, let me just say you're in for a real treat. Um, as the Society of Labor Econ Economists noted, uh, I love this quote, in terms of his enthusiasm for new ideas or new findings, Richard reminds one more of a kid in a sandbox than a Harvard professor. Uh, so here's that kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. Thank you. Well, that's really nice, and, I, uh, and if I live up to it, I will be very happy. Uh, the, 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 the talk is about these fears of our, our decline in the economy, and if you look at today's uh, New York Times, 
you will see an article by an economist who's the chief economist of the HSBC, the big bank, uh, which is all about the end of affluence in the US and other uh, uh, advanced countries, but mostly focusing on the US. Um, that represents, he's sure the decline is here we are and we just better cut back everything. And yes, there are reasons to, to decline, but the GDP is still growing. And so it's, but it's the best way to think of the decline is growing more slowly, but also the uh, benefits of the growth being distributed in a truly astounding way. And that's what the bank economists seems not to have uh, paid any attention to. So what I want to do is talk about the, the, I called it nightmares of tomorrow. So I had the scary guy for Halloween of, of, of the uh, of first. And, and it, it's a funny way of phrasing it, but the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> but you understand what it means. We, 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 we were in the American the lead country, nobody challenging us post the World War uh, II. I mean, the communists did their bit, but they collapsed under their own weight. And now the future doesn't look the same way it did um, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, et cetera. And we have declined relatively to other countries. And, and I want to claim that that is actually a success of America and one of our great successes. And then how might we escape this the nightmare of a, of a country that's decaying, cutting everything back, uh, et cetera. And the, the first chart just shows you the views of we're going the right direction or the wrong direction. There was a brief period of time right around the Obama election when people felt more positive. But in general, we've been in a pretty negative uh, vein for the last decade, at least. At least. Um, and, and obviously, the, the collapse of uh, Wall Street and the, the, the negative effects on the economy have just dampened people's, people's views. This is the chances that today's youths will have a better life than their parents. I'm just going to give you some evidence to, to start us off to the, the negative views. And, 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 and here, you, you do see for the first time like that it's uh, uh, the, 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 the rise of the negative uh, uh, perspective uh, um, and, and, and it being rather si si significant. Uh, uh, the, the, the drop in the fact that you'll be likely to have a better life than your child, that uh, 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 takes its, 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 its beating. Then, specifically in labor issues, now asking people, do you think you'll have a significant the three questions here. Significant pay raise from your current job. And the majority of Americans say no. My, my wages, I don't see it going up uh, in, in the next five years. Or we are, uh, barring a, you know, an economic meltdown, we are going to have growth of GDP. It's the average person understanding that, yeah, GDP grows, productivity goes up, but their wages do not go up. Uh, find the new job that pays more, again. Not likely. And uh, keep your current job in pay. Well, that's sort of the opposite of the other two. So people, that's what people think. I'm st stuck in my job, and, and my pay is not going up, et cetera. And then the set of questions about uh, uh, how do you think it's going to get easier or, or more difficult for various things? Pay for college. Everybody seems to think that's. Uh, Actually, that may, that may be an incorrect view, uh, because if we get the, the massive online uh, open courses, the MOOCs, it's the professors who will be suffering. <laughs> but uh, the, pay, the cost of college will go down, uh, which re re reflects an important thing we'll, I'll come back to. You know, find good jobs, da, da, da. It's just all a very uh, uh, negative uh, per perspective. Now, if we had a good recovery, this would all be gone. We've had a, a, a big disaster and a weak recovery, and a lot of people, as that New York Times, the, the, the chief economist, telling us it's all over. Uh, you guys, are, you, you've had it. 
So, I, I, and I want to give some, some facts supporting this, this negative view. I mean, it's, it's not a view that, uh, what's the correct word? It's not a view that just comes out of being gloomy. So this is labor's share of income in the United States. Um, and I've got three different measures, but you, you don't want to know the details of that. And what you see, uh, labor share comes, comes down. Uh, when I was an assistant professor in Francis, then we were always taught labor's share is constant. It's always, depending again on how you measured it, 65, two thirds would be a good number. And if you measured it some other ways, you get 70%. And, and, and Robert Solo actually wrote a piece about why was, you know, question, why was labor's share always constant? And bang, it's, it's taken a big deep beating down. To the right side is the Gini coefficient of incomes of households. And that is, just keeps going up. It, it just, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a little bit of, a, 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 of, 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 of drop around 2007, 2008, but it just seems to trending upward. So it's a new normal that the rich get richer and the labor gets squeezed. And you can see why people would feel uh, pessimistic about the state of the country and the well-being of their children and the, uh, uh, and the young people should be concerned. Our jobs recovery uh, 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 has just been awful. Uh, we lost five percentage points of our employment rate. Now, economists do the employment divided by population of adults that, that had been running 64%, uh, and it's now 58%, the six points if you take from the absolute peak. Uh, of, uh, of previously, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence in this recovery that it's coming back. You knock off five percent of of uh, people do no longer have jobs. You've got families in 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 poverty. You've got people are very unhappy about their lives, and then we were we were told that the U.S. at least has a very uh, open, flexible job market. So unemployment is very short, short, and the figures there show. Oh yeah, we go, it goes up in a recession, comes down, you know, the, the et cetera. But the mean length of unemployment zoomed up in this great uh, recession, and it hasn't really come down. So the country has more and more people unemployed for over a year, which, given our welfare benefits, uh, that's un unthinkable. That that people, uh, 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 you know, to be, to be jobless for, for such a long period uh, uh, of time. As a matter of fact, it increased so much that the BLS changed the question that they ask in order to capture these longer and longer spells that were unthinkable before. It was always Europe with the social welfare system where people can live for quite an extensive period of time unemployed that, that, that uh, had the long spells. We now look like Europe and the long spells without the social welfare uh, aspects. And then the, the part that is most uh, 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 striking, I, I think to, to almost any, er, any economist, is the blue line is our growth of productivity. And, and productivity is going up. And it always goes up. We have new, new, new technologies, new, 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 you know, new things. It's very hard to make productivity go down. Uh, we, people don't lose the, the knowledge that they, they have. Firms are, are always striving and successfully. Productivity. The, the red line is, is a measure of the um, uh, real, uh, real wages of people. And you see the, the gap widening. That means somebody is taking more <laughs> in, in, in that gap. And of course, that's labor share going down. And because this, this, uh, the, the, this, this, this measure, uh, um, will not take account of uh, the you know, executives getting stock options and things like that. That's the other part of this, of this kind of, of, a, of a gap. Um, now, here's some, some headlines. They actually mis, mis did the headline slightly, so I corrected it. U.S. income is now the most concentrated at the top since 1916. Um, that's a long time ago. Uh, um, we have nobody in the room who was alive then. Maybe somebody's 
grandparents were alive then, uh, 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 um, et cetera. The, uh, that's pretty striking. And then I give you some of the figures for the, what's happened, the upper 0.1%. Now, this is not the upper 1% that the Occupy is worried about. They actually got that somewhat wrong. The upper 1%, got, but it was the, 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 the 0 0.1, the, the one tenth of the upper 1% that made off with the huge increase. It's gigantic. And then ab among that group, it went to the 0.01%. You are seeing one of the most remarkable uh, uh, redistributions of income, in, 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 or, or new distributions of income, a better way of phrasing it, I, I, ever. And so you do, I did a little calculation which just says, hey, if, if we just had held the income distribution at the level it was at the beginning, everybody in the country could have had an 8% <laughs> increase in wages. And then the people wouldn't have been saying, what do I see for the next five years? Oh, no, no wage increase for me. Because after all, people like me, which means the vast bulk of Americans, uh, don't get wage increases. Now, you will, you, 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 know, you graduate university, you get a job. There will be, in the first few years, wage increases, because there's a, a life cycle pattern. So this is for people. People are saying this. It's not that they're not going to get that wage increase. But that's part of your normal thing. But once you're, you're, you're at your job, people are just not, not getting this. Then we have these, to me, unbelievable. This is um, the Treasury Department tells us, for, for whatever reason, uh, they tell us the highest uh, of people with adjusted gross income, the 400 taxpayers who are the top taxpayers. 400 people earn 16% of the net capital gains in the country. 400 people. That tells you one thing. Capital's share is rising. There are very, very few people who own an extraordinary. I mean, this is, I think I did the, did I do the calculation here. No, I didn't. But it's like 0. 0.0000. You know, you keep dropping the O's. You know, and then you get to the 1%. This is an extraordinary distribution. And they earn 6.6% of incomes. So they get 6.5% of the dividends. They pay, on average, tax rate of 25%, uh, which is above the average American, because a lot of Americans, this is a federal income tax uh, uh, things. But, and then the bottom just says, it's off the map of inequality for an advanced country. The, the, the inequality has risen in lots of countries, in lots of advanced countries of late, Germany included, Sweden included. But we are off the map. If we were in Africa, which is about the most, one of the two, Africa and Latin America, the two most unequal places, we would be one of the lower, one of the more unequal countries in Africa. We'd be in the upper half of the African countries. That's just, for an advanced country, that's just remarkable. So, so, this, 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 so I called it a la uh, land of opportunity because they make the distinction makers and takers. But, but here's this, I think the makers are the takers. And it's the, it's the rest of people who, who, who have lost out. Now, it's all very, it's nice to look at the other, at the, 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 the whatever it is. This is the, uh, the billionaires. And For, Forbes in, uh, just put out in March of this year the, uh, the US billionaires. We, we have five of the top 10. We are the leading country in the world for billionaires. And they have, the ones in the, in the Forbes magazine had a wealth, like added up their collective wealth, $1.3 trillion. This is 442 people. Some of them, I'm sure, overlap with the 400 top payers of, uh, uh, of the, in the income tax. The, the, this is, these are unbelievably, oh, here I did have the figure. I did it of the 442 instead of the 400, where it's 0.00038% of the, of the households in the country. It, it, it's, it's, it's a distribution. When that report said that the wealth distribution is, is you know, it's like it was in 1916, where they actually were looking at income statistics. The wealth, I don't know, I don't know anyone who's done the wealth calculation, but it's going to be very similar. It's, it's got to be the most unequal wealth distribution we've, we have ever Ever, ever, ever seen. So that's, now I talked to some of my wealthy friends. Uh, and uh, the man on the top says that he owns the Republican Party. 
The man there ran for president, I believe, as a representative of the upper 1% or something, or point, point, point. And, 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 and there's an element of truth to what, to what to this statement. It's, it's my country. I pay for it. We wealthy people pay most of the damn taxes. And so we have a right to run this country. So I, I show you the share of income tax burden. It says in the, to me, in, inc, uh, of the, of the, uh, uh, in the oh, excuse me, the in is for individual here, individual income tax burden. And what you see is that the upper 1% pays more of income tax than the bottom 95% of Americans. The graph here shows that is not US history. You just, you go back to the good old uh, days in the, uh, uh, the 1980s, 1990s. You know, Ronald Reagan was around, it was not true. <laughs> and so, and the bottom 95% of taxpayers, their share of taxes falls, and the upper 1% of taxpayers rises. And why is that? It, 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 that is because the income distribution has shifted to the upper 1%. And then we saw it's the upper 0.1%, the upper 0.01%, the upper 0.0000, oh, 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 you just, you know, however you carry it off. It, it's, it, it's a tremendous transformation, I think, in our country. Um, oh, somebody's clapping about this, you beast. There, there, well, there's a decent American citizen who's upset. Uh, with this. Uh, and there is this, you can look on the web, this Byzantium uh, uh, security, that, that just for the upper 1% that matters. Uh, it turns out it's a, um, it's a sham advertisement uh, because it's for some movie. <laughs> and it's meant to attract people to pay attention to the movie. But it just fits perfectly uh, for, uh, 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 you know, for, for this, and we do know, in fact, this is a lot of what is true. Uh, uh, yes, they they have guarded villages. They'll have protective things. They'll have their their bodyguards or whatever it'll be. They will have their private jets. They are certainly not living like the rest of us, and they are they are protected. So I said, well, okay, gee, this is who caused this? What's going on? Who do we blame? Well, the 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 survey here says that a lot of people seem to think the real biggest threat to this country is big government. And um, then there's big uh, business. And look who's declining in there. And that's big labor. And I would like to find the 8% of people who think big labor is a giant threat to this country. <laughs> and uh, we're, <laughs> that, that is, yeah, you don't even know really what, what world they're, they're living in. What's interesting is in, 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 in this survey, they, they did not do a, uh, a breaking up of what are the people who say big government is the danger. Um, certainly, it's, to me, it's a legitimate concern. Is it that they're spying on us? Is it the NSA? You could, be, you could worry about that. You could worry about that from the right or the left. Um, is, is, it, is it that the b b big government's a danger to us because it's basically owned by the smaller and smaller fraction of people? That would be more of a left perspective. Um, in, in the right perspective I give over here, Obamacare is going to drive up unemployment and health care costs, and that's causing it's fascism in the US. And, and of course, you, you know that the Obamacare or you, is a conservative Republican plan, which was meant to, so we wouldn't have national health insurance, conservatives, when conservatives tried to devise reasonable alternatives you know, to social problems, this is, they came up with the private market, the, the dot, 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 and, and they came out with one of the think tanks, the conservative think tanks, when, when they were doing a you know, good job, I'd say, at least offering alternatives. And now the same guys are accusing this of being evil socialism and it's going to destroy the country. This was their solution when they wanted to see Americans get more health care, but to do it through private markets as opposed to the government, which this can be a legitimate thing. This is the, from the EPI, which is uh, the Economic Policy Institute. It's a left think tank, and there's a lot of blaming China. 
this is all China is, is, is a, a China problem. So I see some estimates of what's the effect of China on US jobs. Uh, this is now from the economist is pretty right wing, but uh, they appreciate that the banksters are there. The, 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 the finance has really turned out to be a, a disastrous uh, thing. And um, the financial sector has just grown and grown and grown. So if you look at the statistics, you say GDP has grown. You know, obviously, in this recession and re weak recovery, not as much as it did, but it's grown. Uh, but one sector has grown massively and has recovered massively, which is the finance sector. And finance sector means very wealthy people. Uh, a, and, and, it's, it, and it's just the growth has been directed towards a very small number of folks. Then you, you, will, you, you, have, you often have this fear, um, and the, the professors can be fearful of this as well. And so robot workers are coming for your job. Um, and every time there's unemployment, people always say, oh, it's technology. They said it in the 60s. They said it in the Great Depression, <laughs> that it was all due to automation and things like this. And the fact that it's always turned out to be false does not mean that it's going to be false this time. Uh, the robots really are moving along very, very well. And uh, uh, you know, Watson uh, can do Jeopardy. The, uh, the robots, uh, the robots, the, you know, computer, uh, it's, it's any sort of machine things, can do stuff. And now we professors are faced with uh, our, this, our MOOCs, the future of higher education. You think of what's happened in the university setting. Who does a lot of work in universities? It's adjunct professors. They have no job security, or very little. Uh, they are paid way below uh, Cornell tenured professors, or Cornell system professors, for that matter, people who are on the tenure track. Um, they are growing share uh, of, of, of the teaching university. And soon, what do we need those guys for? We'll just have famous actors give the lectures. So instead of me, you would have some famous actor giving you know, the script. I would write the script in the background, and the famous guy gives it. And, and then we could go down the list and say, oh, you teach economics, friend? You teach economics? We don't need you anymore. We have got this very famous actor or actress. You know, wouldn't you rather you know, listen to Oprah Winfrey speak than me on these things? And, and, and uh, thank you. <laughs> but, but the point is, the MOOCs are coming, and they really are having, going to have an effect. And, but it's the same kind of thing occurring every place. So this, you know, some, I, th I think there's some, uh, uh, actually, I wouldn't dismiss that as, as, a, as a factor. Now, so now what do we know about these, these causal things that could have caused this? Uh, um, I think there was a major role, I think a growing body of economics evidence says there really was a globalization factor. And those of you who remember the NAFTA period, we debated NAFTA under President Clinton. To say that globalization was a negative factor, you were, you know, you, you, the, the, the administration just jumped all over you. It was all technical change. And by the way, we can't do anything about technical change. And because they were pushing the, 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 the free trade agreement. We were told that, oh, we're going to get educated, and all we have to do is get educated and uh, don't worry about the foreign competition. Well, by the way, the Mexicans are smart too, and they can see that education is a positive step forward for their, and the Chinese can see that, and everybody can see that. And so the notion that somehow or other America was going to have this uh, monopoly of edu higher education was that not very thoughtful. The whole world's invested in education and technology. Uh, the basic theory of trade, the basic trade theory, factor price equalization, says that when people are trading, tra are trading freely, ultimately the real the the, the wage wages will be similar. They'll move towards. Cost. So the idea that you would be having a, a decline of trade barriers, which I'm in favor of decline of trade barriers. But it's an with an understanding that's going to have some consequences that you might want to address. And we've now learned that this has had large, large, large effects uh, 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 on us. I call this doubling the global workforce. 
because when China and India joined the global workforce, they were not part of the, 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 the modern world. That, that basically doubled the number of people. More people, that's going to benefit capital. It's going to perhaps play a role in why capital's share has gone up. We have weaker labor unions. And this here, there's now, at this point, no disagreement, except among that 8% that is worried about the, the big labor is powerful. And, uh, um, because every country we see that when you have stronger unions, you have more uh, pay equal, equal, equalization. The right wing doesn't like that because they think it's, it's interfering with a, a, an efficient competitive market. And the, 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 the workers whose wages are a bit up like that. And we, so weaker that is done this. And then there's this financialization, the banking business, which, which just adds some, some funny level, adds extra charges onto everything. <laughs> Uh, where the banker is sitting there and, and, and taking uh, things off, and was, I think everyone agrees, the, was the main cause of the Great Recession. Uh, the, 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 so the, they, they did us such harm in that that if they had done any good, which I'm, I'm very dubious of at this point, but if they had done any good in moving capital around and lowering risk, they, the disaster more than offset whatever good they did. I say that technology, Things, but I'm slightly suspicious of those robots. I, I, I uh, we'll talk about that towards the end. There's some discussions about our structural changes in the society. We have more immigrants. Immigrants do make up a, 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 dis a disproportionate number of poor people in in the in the U.S. Um, we have this big increase of female workers that adds to the workforce, and you could argue that that therefore makes it harder on, on the labor in general. And I put in bold the one that I find most uh, 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 convincing. We've had an extraordinary uh, situation where the word crony capitalist is a word the, the right wing likes to refer to many of the deals that the Obama administration has struck. And I think they're correct in work about those deals. Um, but they sort of a little less about had Mr. Romney been elected, <laughs> there also would have been crony capitalist deals. And some, in some cases, the, 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 the rich companies and, 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 and people, they, they, they give money to both parties so that they can, that whatever happens, they will be treated differently. And I, I refer here to the revolving door regulators. I, I could not understand why the, uh, Eric Holder in the, uh, the Treasury Department and the, uh, the Justice Department was not going after some of these big banks. And I had a right wing or libertarian kind of friend, and he said, Oh, this goes to show how little you know, Professor. And I said, Well, well tell me why. Holder comes from the, comp from the law firm that basically defends big banks. And he's going to go back to the law firm that defends big banks. Now, as they're, as they're leaving Washington, they're starting up some of this. But then you sort of sit there and say, oh, so is he now going to switch to the other side when he, after, you know, when he leaves, the, leaves the job? The number of people from this administration, from the Bush administration, from the, who, who do this revolving door stuff is truly unbelievable. Uh, I mean, just, you just, you're, you're working at the SEC as a high job. And you know that if you deal with this company harshly, you probably have given up $50 million of income. Because you would get a job paying $1 million plus for the rest of your life you know, if, if, if you leave. And, and, and it's, everybody understands that. Um, so uh, that's what we have, is, is, is the situation. And then I, I think the blaming Obamacare. Well, I just, you know, Obamacare came after the recession. <laughs> Obamacare has not yet been seriously implemented. It's just beginning. So that's certainly, you know, there may be some reasons to worry about some of its future effects, but something that isn't here yet uh, is a little hard to believe uh, had much effect to this. And I, and I just said uh, the idea that is any, any excessive regulation is crazy. We deregulated and we lost. So we have some, some, some factors, I think, are there. But now the, 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 the thing we should all be scared about, the real uh, Halloween, uh, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, is there may be more coming. This may not be the worst that we have seen. So if you read the I, IPCC, that's a 
that's Sydney, uh, Australia, if there are any Australians here, that's going under, underwater by some prediction of uh, global warming. Um, that's the Opera House, I believe, of Sydney. Um, this, that's uh, the darkness of the, uh, if the debt ceiling is breached, you've seen all these horror stories being told that that may occur. I do not know whether that's true or false. Those, those, you know, will we'll, 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 we'll the whole system freeze again and we be back into another financial crisis? Um, God only knows. Um, and then there was a fascinating little article said, why did bankers destroy the world? Well, the simple answer was because they could make more money doing that because you leverage and take on giant risks and you make lots of money. And by the way, you leave with your bonus and pay. And if the bank crashes, I mean, you don't want that to happen. And but then this is, this is what students, at least at Harvard, are always, are you hiring? <laughs> Can I get a job at Goldman Sachs? And you say, well, no. Goldman Sachs, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh J J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan was a bank that went through the crisis not doing bad things. Well, they now have caught them. <laughs> they were doing the worst things going on. And, and Goldman Sachs, everyone knows, is, is, is about the, whatever it is. Well, you say this. I talked to, to, to a couple of people at Goldman Sachs. And they were saying some deals they were working. And then I said, oh, but wait, you, you told me you're, you're actually doing the, you're buying these shares or whatever it is you were doing through J.P. Morgan. I said, why don't you buy them from Goldman Sachs and give, give the commission to Goldman guys? They said, do you think we would trust Goldman Sachs? Yeah. <laughs> so bang. So, so there's, 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 there's potential we could just be facing in the next six months some disaster of, of a major kind. The Sydney Harbor will will not rise up and take over Australia that quickly, or, or, or there. And so, uh, whoops, oh, yes. So this is the monster coming back from the Halloween. And uh, uh, he says, gee, uh, it's not, we're not, things aren't going to be too bad unless we see the Munch lady scream. And there's the Munch lady screaming from the, the picture. You just go, oh, my god, the world's coming to an end. Um, and then I said, well, shh, don't scream too loud. <laughs> so yes, there's a lot of things going on that can, that can legitimately you know, concern us. They, 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 there are reasons to worry about, I think, the, the, the future. Uh, now I want to put the, a different perspective on this, these patterns, and less, less scary, and let's look. Uh, we've, we have about 6% of the world's population, 5 to 6%, depending on how good the census counts are in, in China and in India. And after World War II, it was pretty extraordinary. We had most everything that was good. Uh, 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 there was a great dollar shortage because everybody was buying American goods because America was the only country that was producing goods. I mean, Europe was destroyed, the, the, the China was a mess, Japan was destroyed. Uh, and the Russians just were producing nuclear bombs or something. Uh, we had, and this gets back to the big labor, we had the strongest and most powerful private sector unions in the world. And our unions, private sector, were not. George Meany, who was head of the union, the union movement after the unification, uh, he once said, public sector workers, Nah, we had a big cigar. You know, they're, they're just the bureaucrats. They can't be union members, and and so we, we actually did not. We're not. Uh, we're way behind. Had no, no, very little. I think New York City may have had some union guys, but nowhere else. Uh, we had mass higher education that made us the leading place in the world for university graduates. So you go back to the to the NAFTA. Clinton administration view, it's like they were living back in the world when we were the only people who educated people widely. And then after the Sputnik shock, we became the world's greatest investor in R&D and became really extraordinarily powerful in the, in the sciences. And so I, 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 unfortunately, because of the, clothing, the, the clo closing of the federal um, 
uh, websites. I couldn't update. I couldn't give some of the statistics here that I wanted to give. Because it's, uh, uh, I did find something for global beer. So we, we had been 36%, and now we're down to 20%. You know, that's at the, it's almost a halving of our. And then I looked at some of the other things we had in 68, but you can't go on the web and get the statistical abstract data because the census site is closed because of the, um, uh, of the government shutdown. We had 26% of rayon and acetate. Remember, we're 6%. So that's, to have more than 6% of anything is huge. 46% of the automobiles in use in 1968 were in the US. If you actually go back to the to, um, uh, 1950s, we were 80% of the automobiles in use were American. It's just, it's just it's so, you know. And 68% uh, we were doing of the civilian aviation miles. And this is in 68. Uh, 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 um, and, uh, but I, I couldn't. I, I, when they closed the site, I wasn't going to go to the library. It's not pulling out old abstracts <laughs> to get the figures right. Because the message, you get the message. So we, we really had this extraordinary thing. Well, it, in some sense, we have to decline. And we should decline. We, can't, we shouldn't be the, the rich upper 1% or whatever it is in the world and everybody else be, be poor. And the world caught, has caught up with us tremendously. If you look at productivity figures, Western Europe, if you do it as production per hour is equal to or ahead of the US. Some countries are ahead of the US. A lot of countries are equal to the US. And it's, it's very similar. When you go to France, and it's the same machines, and the same this as you go to Germany. Maybe it's a little more modern stuff at this, at this point. You go to Belgium, and they have high hourly productivity, and, 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 and et cetera. Europe, Western Europe is today ahead of the US in producing higher education. Again, it varies across countries, but the US, which was number one by far, is now, I think, 14th or 16th, right in the middle of the pack of the advanced countries. So, so and as they should. I mean, we helped this with our Marshall Plan, and we wanted this to happen. And they were catching up in employment rate until the, this austerity bomb fell, and now they're below what we are, and we just took a 5% uh, cut. Japan, we know, caught up with mass production. Korea is now the number one country in use of the internet and in higher education, fraction of young people who go to higher education. And you know, Korea, 1950s, was this destroyed, pop, poverty-ridden, et cetera. And they do a lot of high tech, as you know, Samsung, Samsung phones. So they, they China, Mr. Mao conducted a war against Chinese society with the, with the, with the, the Cultural Revolution. They now, in this last year, they, they produced 7 million university graduates, the most of any, course, anybody in the world. 7 million is more people than in most uh, countries in the world. So they are just producing university graduates. Quality is not up to American standards by far, but, but obviously but first you produce and then you get your quality up, and that's what they, what they are doing. And then in this recession, the US had a weak recovery, Europe had a weak recovery. The developing countries all did better. They came out of it better. So all across the board, you see the world catching, catching up uh, w with us. And then this is another survey thing. Uh, less, uh, le it should be less of the world uh, sees the US as the leading global economic power. This is just 2008 to 2013. Um, you see the numbers going from 47% thought the US was the leading power, China 20%. Now it's 41% and 34%. And uh, I don't give the figures for the Americans, but Americans have it about evenly split between the US and China. So a, a lot of people seeing, oh, China's the coming e economic power. And then will they become the superpower? And you have lots of people around the world saying, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, so, so we, we, this relative decline, a big sign for China to show that they really are catching up with us is they are now known as the country with the ugliest tourists. Used to be the ugly American tourist, as you know. I show you some pictures of our, our, our fellow citizens. And then I show you some pictures of some Chinese citizens. And the statement that Chinese tourists' bad manners 
were harming the country was by the Chinese Minister of Tourism or something. And he, he, and he, he was passing, they were going to pass some, some laws saying Chinese tourists have got to be polite or something. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, we, we wouldn't pass laws to such a thing. There's inconceivable China could ever impose, some, you know, et cetera. And then there's a story about how they, sur they surpassed us in being the things. What it really is a sign, though, if anybody here is at the hotel school, this is very important. China is today the most tourist in the world. They spend more money per tourist than, the, than anyone else, uh, or any, any major country. I, I, I don't know how they dealt with Liechtenstein or something in these data, uh, which means there's a really, there was a very wealthy group of Chinese. And the same way Americans, when we were the ugly tourists, they just want to go out and see the world and spend your money on, 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 on et cetera. And there they are. Um, so they really, that's, that's a, form, a form of catch up. Then I want to just point out, China also remains very poor. And what I've done here is take gr the gross national income of China and the US, 1980 and 2012. Well, you see, China was extraordinarily poor in 1980. Remember, Mao had been there destroying every, everything he could possibly uh, you know, de de destroy in, 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 in an effort to, I don't know what, change humanity, change the way people behave. 2012, that's incredible growth rate. I mean, obviously, it's huge. The US, much slower growth rate. China was 8.5%, ours is 1.7%. But then I looked at what the absolute change was. U.S. starts off at a extremely wealthier than China. Actually, the absolute difference between the countries grows bigger. It's about, uh, uh, this is a per capita, uh, per person. So it's 20,000, and, and, and then it, it goes up to 35,000 or so. Uh, uh. So we actually, the Americans became, the, in absolute incomes, Americans got further ahead of the Chinese. And, uh, and I said 2015 was my estimate is when China will finally start to close the real income gap. Because uh, you obviously, if you keep growing at 8.5 and you keep growing at 1.7, uh, ultimately the 8.5 is going to beat out the, the 1.7. But the, just uh, understanding how poor China was at the beginning, and if you look within China, you see many, many, uh, 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 half a billion, more, more poor people, really poor people in China than and there is in the whole US. So you, you, it, it's, 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 it's an interesting kind of contrast. So I think the US policies played a big role in the decline, the relative decline of the US. And I think they are wonderful policies in that respect. Because the idea that we, we're not trying to, we're trying to bring the rest of the world to things that succeeded in our country. And the rest of the world is not, once they got rid of the communist, um, the communist party is still in charge of China. But the, once they got rid of the communist ideology and, and this, this stuff, yeah, the, the rest of the world said, yeah, we can get onto this and they can do very well. So, and we aided Europe and Japan. Uh, the globalization, I think, had a huge effect in spreading things around. And uh, we, had a, we had this giant advantage in education, in R&D, in technical change. But by the way, the, you know, the, the, the Germans now educated, the French educated, they're spending money on R&D, and they, you know, they're as smart as, as we are. Um, and so, yeah, they're going to have things, and the China is, Part of China is pretty modern, um, in a smaller part of India, but the same sort of thing. Then I think our multinationals, who, who in many stories of globalization from a worker's side are villainous, they, you know, they're moving jobs from the advanced countries, poor countries. I think they've actually been an angel <laughs> because they bring the latest technology to the countries they go to. They generally pay people in those countries somewhat better than the people are getting in those countries. But of course, we in the, in the advanced countries are suffering some loss from this. I mean, if you can have the same uh, machine and the same mode of production in a country where the wages are still way below American wages, 
and you're looking for profit and you're multinational, that's what you'll do. It benefits the people there and it brings some harm to, to the people here. And that's, uh, and, 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 and I think we've done a tremendous job of trying to selling uh, market capitalism and, and democracy, you know, as a, as a, as a, a system. And it, this has to cause us to decline. And I think that we should be per happy that the rest of the world is catching up uh, 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 with us in, in that respect. Um, I said here, we wanted it. We said this was our policy. We got it. There now is much greater competition, uh, not in this particular industry. We have an almost monopoly. We have a monopoly in professional wrestling, uh, and 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 very few other countries are that interested in it uh, by chance. So this is part of Americana. What's the single most important thing that that, that has caused this? spreading of, of success elsewhere. The single most important thing, I called it the one ring to rule them all from uh, a famous book and movie that you uh, all know. It's, it's been what we do in our industry, spread of knowledge. Once you have people in other countries who have the same knowledge that we have, they're going to university, of course they are going to compete with us and they're going to ultimately, cap, you know, not catch up with us, but they'll, they'll, we'll be in the same plane of operation. And there's some figures. In 1970, the earliest I could get figures uh, 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 for, the U.S. had 29% of the university students. 6% of the population of the world, 29% of university students. That is just about, I think, our beer, a little below our beer production at that, that time, but so on. Um, and, and now it's, the last year I could get UN data from, it's 11%. Um, the US, and there you look at, particularly China, 30 million enrolled students in 2010. You know, you divide that by, by four, and you get basically 7 million graduates coming out a year. You see that that, that, that operates. India much uh, didn't have Mao to destroy them, so they did have students in, uh, in, in 1970, and in, in 2010, they're also huge, but just not, did not uh, do, it, do it the same as China. And the other advanced countries have also did a big increase in there. So, so we're now living in a world where we, we, are not, we do not monopolize the absolute, you know, the best and the top of, of, in education. International students, I'm sure that Cornell's loaded with international students. Everywhere in the U.S. is loaded with them. That's been the fastest growing part of the uh, of, of the spread of knowledge. Because that means you're learning your stuff here, most uh, here in, in Australia, in the absolutely top advanced Western universities, um, in Oxford and, and Cambridge, and you know, you can go through, the, through a list. Um, and you're going, and you, many people go stay, and many people go ha back to their home country. Uh, and that just spreads the absolute top that we have in knowledge. Um, because it's, it's tough if you're, you're setting up, a, you've got a university, I, I know China best, you know, if you've got a university in, the, in Hunan province, you're just not going to have the same type of education. Uh, it's just very hard to build a, a great thing. And now here is the scientific papers. U.S. was 35.9% in 1981. Again, 6% of the population away. Um, China was 0 0.3, thanks to Mao. They, the, the scientists were all sitting in dunce caps, uh, you know, in, in, in villages. Um, and they've now expanded. And the U.S. has lost 10 points off that. Um, the other advanced countries basically held their own. And it's basically been China coming on massively in, in, in R&D and higher education, in the scientific work. Now, you can either say, oh, my God, that's a competitor for us. And then you look and who do the Chinese collaborate with when they write papers, disproportionately with Americans. And then you kind of say, well, do, do I care if they make some great medical advance in Shanghai or, or in Berkeley? No. They'll make me healthier. It's better to have more of these people in, in a, a, a place that is one-sixth of the world's population. We want to see more scientific papers and more science coming out of it. Out of it, and, and the Americans, I think, to our credit, played a really positive role in, in that, et cetera. So, 
So I, I view this thing as this, uh, we, we got a huge gain for hu humankind by the US becoming relatively, our decline in relative position. Because it's not that we've gone backwards, it's that everybody else has come up. And so that's the singularity where when you get, you can get just explosive creation of things when you have, uh, I would stress science and engineering brains. Some of people at MIT kind of places think it's, oh, with the great computers, that's your robots. They'll just solve all our problems. And this is a network map of connection. It's hard to see, but it's connecting all the different sciences together. So we, we, we've, we, we've really have created an extraordinary system. And our, 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 our uh, industry, the unit of higher education, I, I should be proud of it in some sense, for all the flaws that we have. And everybody who knows a dean or someone knows there are lots of flaws. Uh, you know, the administration's clumsy, da, 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 da. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really done something remarkable. And there's more people today, educated, able to do stuff. And, and, and then I said, we have some advantages in this world, which uh, uh, we still attract the best and brightest people. We admit them as immigrants. Uh, uh, um, and people from lower income countries do s stay in, in large numbers, including the Chinese and Indians. They work with our researchers. They're part of the same community. Uh, uh, I'm sure Cornell, it's like, every, like Harvard, like, uh, Berkeley, other places. Take, take a professor and you move him to, to, to a Chinese lab for a while, and he's just as happy because he's got his Chinese students at that lab as he is at the lab in the US. And you move Chinese guys to, to the US, and everybody's working together collaboratively. Uh, and, and this is definitely true in my university. The top leaders and the, top, and the children of the leading academics in, in Asian countries go to the American universities. They, they think that we have something better than their universities. And I think we do, uh, though their universities hopefully will catch up. And we now even find people coming to American high schools and prep schools more, 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 more if they can afford it, and, and coming for undergraduates, which that one has never done. So, it's, you know, et cetera. And then I hear that Cornell has this, um, it's your, uh, I think, management school works with a French university, somebody else, a global innovation index, and who's great in global innovation? The US is, is, the, is, the, is, is the country that really comes out very well. We were fifth to a bunch of European countries, but they're not as big as we are, so actually our swath is much greater. So I, I don't see us as in this, this you know, that decay, decay, decay. It's just who's gonna get the benefits of, of, of the progress? Uh, this, Americans, we believe in hard work and so on and so forth. I was going to say, this is just great. We, we much more believe that you succeed if you do hard work than all the other countries. And then I thought the Pakistanis were the one country higher than us. And, in, in, and, that, and you know, Pakistan's a bit of a disaster as a country. There are people shooting everybody all the time. The women are locked up in their, uh, you know, in part. And, you know, in kind of, but, but if we exclude Pakistan, we're the number one country believing in hard work. Um, and so this still is a, a, a good things. And then while the um, Americans think their children are not going to do as well, as, this was asked of kids. It's fifth to twelfth graders. American kids are still very optimistic. Now you guys are nobody here from the twelfth grade at this point. So I don't know how you feel. Now you have a job market out there. But they think, oh, man, they're going to go. And, and, and so there's still some, 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 some stuff that I see very positively. I'm going to read this. And now I want to just conclude with saying what I think is, is how we get to a better future. Uh, um, so I quote Justice Brandeis here, which is a, um, an important thing about the concentration of wealth, which, which, which is, I think, the part of the, what's really gone wrong in a deep way in the country. He says you can't have democracy and, or, 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 and, and this concentration. And then I quoted uh, Cassius, at least as reported by, by William Shakespeare, is that if, if we're going to allow our country to turn into a place where there are some billionaires own everything and we're all being replaced by robots and I don't know what we're doing or something, um, 
oh, let me just say, I want to be replaced by a robot. I just want to own my own robot. So I make the income <laughs> that the ro robot gets. And everybody should, that should be our goal. We do want the new technologies. We do want the things to make life easier. We just have to have some share of the returns to that. Um, and, and, and so there's Cassius. And so I, I think the problem is, 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 is partly this. I'm very uneasy that this crony capitalism, the income distribution can reach such a point that it becomes, I call it here, an, attra a, 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 an attractor, a stable state, where you just get stuck. You, both political parties receive huge contributions from rich characters. Uh, the students from major Ivy League universities all go to Wall Street. Those are very smart students. They're smarter than, 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 than average person. And they're all working to make sure Wall Street can rip us off again. Uh, and you know, it becomes an equilibrium. It's very hard to, the 8% the who are worried that the trade unions were going to push back against Wall Street. And so, you know, you just, it, one doesn't see that, that is happening. And, and, and I think, I called it economic feudalism. Because it's like the, the masters of the, uh, of, you know, the lords of the manors and everybody else's serfs working for them. We know the solution is not going to be socialism with public ownership. State-directed capitalism is more like the Chinese, but I'm dubious that that, uh, you know, in the end, that that's going to be uh, overly successful. So I am in favor of something called inclusive capitalism, uh, and, and which has, a, it turns out, an interesting place in American history. And here I give you some views of crony capitalism. Just, first of all, Adam Smith was deeply concerned about it. And it's a part of Adam Smith that gets forgotten. And he, he called it combinations of masters, not combinations of workers are the danger. Because there are very, because there are much fewer masters, they have a lot more resources, workers less. And then Machiavelli says this, he who has the gold gets to rule. He who rules gets the gold. That's this, what I call the attractor state stable equilibrium. There's a small group of people running the show. And they set the rules, and they keep running the show. And that's, I, I, that, that is a potential end of our, of our society for a period. This is James Madison, who is often thought of as the hero of the more conservative American thinkers. Well, he had a very clear vision. And it says, he says there's two possibilities. Um, it's, and it has to do with whether power slides into hands not interested in the rights of property. That means capital ownership to be, have assets. He says, and it's possible they will unite and become dupes and instruments of ambition, um, or else they will become mercenary instruments of wealth. So if I'm the rich guy, I buy everybody's votes in here, and, and I pay you some money, and, and that's the one equilibrium he's worried about. And the other one he's worried about is that I'm the rich guy and you all come charging up here and burn my house down uh, you know, and, take, and try to take my, my riches. Um, and, and so that's the concern. And, and then he says at the bottom of the Federalist Paper 62, it may be said with some truth the laws are made for the few, not for the many. So it's a deep concern. With, with what, in a democracy, with how do you fight back against this, the, 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 this, this, this problem? Uh, there's pictures of other people who've worried about this. If you read science fiction, that's a wonderful old, old book. Uh, but it's all about a world run by a, by a small number of bad guys. And so I then thought, well, is there a pathway to, to, to rebuilding? I think are things. We're going to have growth unless we screw up really badly. But it's, right now, it's all going to a few people. And that does not bode, I think, well for, for us. So I have this professional wrestler who's famous for having said, yes, yes, yes. And then when that gimmick was getting a little tiresome to the audience, he started yelling, no, no, no. Um, and then there's a wonderful statue in the middle of them. So is there a pathway? Well, 
I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you the path, Ray. And I said, here, you wouldn't believe it. I knew if I told you, because I'm obviously not so wise or smart or knowledgeable, and social science has not got that good stuff. But I gave you a clue to what this is. And I uh, see for friends, what the hell is this? Uh, well, it just basically means, you know, there is no simple answer that we could say as scientists. We, we know that as social scientists. Um, but I do think whatever the solution is going to be, it has to be with our owning more of the capital. Capital's share goes up. We have to have a larger share of capital owned by people. And, and, it, and it has to be where we are sharing in all. Of, we own our own robot. I don't want... I don't want Bill Gates. I'm nothing against Bill Gates, of course. I don't want him owning the robot that replaces me. Uh, and uh, I want to own my own robot. And remember, the whole of the technology and the robots, they're created by universities, by knowledge base, by the investments in society into us all. And, and that's my, uh, uh, my, that's, that's my the solution that I didn't want to tell you in the sense of, because it's up to you to think about it, too. OK. You do it, you do it. Uh, okay, so Richard will uh, take questions, respond to comments. If you uh, want to be uh, part of the answer, well, uh, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Uh, we just have one, one rule. Would you please stand up and speak loudly? This happens to be an auditorium in which it's easy for you to hear people in front of the room. Hard for you to hear other people in the audience. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the monetary is responsible for our current economic condition, but what do you see as the future for major um, economic downsides to that legislation? Oh. Well, one is that we're still leaving 30, I don't know, 30 million people not covered, or some large fraction of people. It, it is a very expensive healthcare system. And we know, we know the ones that work and, and are less expensive. Canada has one. Britain has one, et cetera. So by, that, that system straddled. It, it took this Republican conservative way, and it straddled, it, and it's costly. So the, the fact that it, it, it is expensive, um, because you are you're, you're not doing a single payer system. And he decided early on that that was not going to happen in this country. Every, you talk to business people in every other country and they just think we're crazy because there is a way to do a health care system. It, it's, let, me, let me give you the, the, the example. The most efficient probably policy the government has is Social Security. It cuts the checks, the administrative costs are nothing, and, and, and we've basically abolished poverty among elderly people. Uh, the more poverty is now among young, young, young people. And, uh, Imagine if we had that set up where people were buying different uh, parts. We gave everybody their money, their Social Security taxes, and, and give them something extra. So, because, you know, whatever you, you, you could do that. And then they would have to go out and buy their own private insurances, their own private uh, annuity programs, and so on. The Bush, who wanted to privatize Social Security, did a, they did a simulation of what would happen. I think it was the GAO probably did it, but one of the big government. And it terrified, ter I have friends of the Bush administration, and it just terrorized them. <laughs> because it, 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 you'd put, you'd put, all you needed was a Wall Street collapse, and you would have had poverty among the elderly, people would have been destroyed. And, and, and so in, in the healthcare thing, they've gone through the more difficult, expensive um, system. Uh, and it does put, it, it is not reducing the costs to the extent that we could have. But, you know, I understand they faced great political uh, constraints to, have, to ha have said, look, the Canadians can carry it off and they're not socialists. The Brits can carry it off and they're not socialists. And in literally every uh, European country, you know, has a form of, na of national health care. And then you're not forcing people to, to buy from a private. Uh, I mean, part of the libertarian 
opposition is now you're forcing me to buy a product uh, and what's the next product you're going to force me to buy? As opposed to the government saying, hey, this is part of, you know, it's, you're not forced to go through private, private, through private companies. That's, I, I. Could I uh, ask you a question out of uh, surprise, uh, uh, even Miles Scott, it's, it, what you said at the end. Uh, I, I expected you uh, to, because of your emphasis on how uh, a few people are gaining from what's essentially an expanding economy to uh, talk about uh, end of the stall and the spread of advanced education in the US, uh, uh, given your emphasis on centrality of education, job security, a safety net, because people have, most people have enough stuff, but they're really worried about security. Instead, you talked about the spread of wealth and that evokes a thought of, uh, give everyone stock or more stock. Well, but the value of stock fluctuates. That can be a big oh, problem right. with people uh, without a, a lot of it. Uh, a very little control uh, of stock owners, of people on top, giving rise to the shenanigans uh, uh, that, that worried you. And the, the financial the leverage uh, uh, that worries you, as we learned, and that can be very good. For, you, for your stocks. So have I misunderstood the cure? Could you say more about how No, no. Uh, okay. yeah, no, you, mean, you, you, you got raised a very a good, good uh, area. It, it, remember, capital share is going up and labor share is falling. It's in the US and it, but literally every other country in the world. We have a trend towards it. And who owns the capital is going to be the, the wealthy and powerful. Um, if workers have a greater share of that, in, 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 and the governance thing is very important too as well, because our pension funds do own chunks of capital. TIA CREF is a very good one, where the, where the where we, where we professors, I assume Cornell is also TIA CREF. Yeah. Um, but in many of the pension funds are just basically listen to the Wall Street characters and don't, and, uh, don't don't really act uh, uh, say fully responsibly or aggressively as the, as, as as they should. No, the 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 I had a call from the White House in February, and they said the president wants to say something in the State of the Union address about addressing the inequality and and the rising share of capital. And and I thought about that, and I said, well, uh, I you don't you don't want to declare a war of labor against capital. We've, we've, we've had that with the kind of Marxist stuff, and the unions are pretty weak, so you, you ain't got any soldiers on your war if you wanted to do that. I don't think it's really very viable. And I, and I said the only solution that I can see is to have more people owning part of capital. Now, there's risk. That, that's right. So you, would, you want your pension fund to own lots of, uh, you know, you want it to be uh, uh, distributed among lots, as a mutual fund kind of operation among many different companies. Um, but that, it does put some risk onto workers, but the risk today on workers is losing their job. So this shifts the risk to maybe losing, if the company's not doing so well, they're losing some of their income. Uh, but if you allow a small number of people to control the capital thing, I don't see how you ever reverse uh, or, you know, what's, what's been going on. So I put great, great stress on that. Let me just say, I, I have a new book coming out with two of my colleagues, uh, uh, not co Harvard colleagues, colleagues, people at Rutgers, uh, in, in which we point out that the entire American tradition uh, goes Abe Lincoln, the Homestead Act, the Jefferson, the, Jeff the, the, the uh, Louisiana Purchase, everybody, and, and James Madison also, by the way, quoted the problems. Everybody was all about, every American should have a plot of land, which was capital. That was the capital at that time, because it was agricultural society. And that we could never become, uh, they called it wage slaves. They were thinking of the, and he, you, you work for somebody, he's going to, you know, et cetera. Uh, um, the, today, the, what's, what's the equivalent of land? It's, it's ownership of the stock of capital, uh, of companies big public corporations and so on and other things. Um, 
And I, th I think that American view that we should all be, have assets, and we can rely on our assets to, to, to do it. It's risky, yeah, there's this risk. Um, and you do have to do with the governance thing. That's very, very, very important. But you think about this recession. Who's come back really well? The capital. The profits are back. American workers, if their wa wages or chances of jobs went up as rapidly as the stock market after the collapse, we would all be doing wonderful. Um, so I, I don't see any, in a, in a capitalist, it's a system that is capitalist, and has you know, great virtues to capitalism, uh, we should all try to be somewhat capitalist. And that was the American view, and the European view was the it was, you know, Marxism, m Marxism. It was the, 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 the revolutionary classes had to be in, in battle. And, and, and Madison, who's extraordinary when you read him, he sees the, the, the danger that if capital is controlled by a few people, Democracy, he, he's a believer in Brandeis' statement. We're, we're just done. Uh, and, 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 and then, so he sees that, and so he wants to see how, uh, you know, more people have that point of his land. And, but he actually has some statements where he says, I don't see where there's enough land in America, even after Jefferson's you know, purchase and so on, of where we're going to be able to spread out good productive land so everybody can be an independent farmer. Um, and he's correct, but he didn't imagine that we'd have these giant corporations and things which, we, uh, you know, where we could d divide up, uh, have that distributed uh, uh, differently. So, I, 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 yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think, I mean, more higher education, fine, but uh, if this higher educated or like our Ivy League students and they're all going to go off to Wall Street, that's not going to... They, they, they do engineering, and they do science, and they do you know, other things. That, that's a, a different business. But uh, right now, they're all being sucked. At Harvard, we had one class in 2008, right for the collapse, that the number who went to Wall Street just dropped. And I'm sure that occurred in all the things. And now it's back to the same numbers it was b b b b b before. Well, so maybe if we, if we own shares, of the things they'll be working for, for the American people instead of for a small number. Um, but you gave some interesting statistics about the level of inequality is parallel now to, say, 1960. And I thought I was in the mind. I thought it was the 1920s. But in any case, it did go down quite a bit in the 1920s and the 60s. So why do you think something very different is necessary now? Because we, we, uh, we it's, it's a great, great question. It really says, how come the society responded to the Great Depression differently than it did to the Great Recession? Um, and it clearly responded differently uh, uh, to, to, to it. And the, and the Great Depression led to all the New Deal programs. The unions were, came back with a vengeance, um, et cetera. We see in this great, in the response to this Great Recession, we don't see anything like that. Uh, remember Mr. Obama supposedly told the banks, I'm going to save you from the mob, uh, et cetera. And he clearly, all the Federal Reserve policies, you know, thank, thank heavens they're trying to boost the economy. But basically, they, they recapitalized the banks. They used our taxpayer money to recapitalize banks. That is not what we did in the... In the so we, we, we had one nasty shock that could have had the effects that you suggest. Now, it's possible there'll be another nasty collapse. And at that point, I don't think the American people would put up with the same, let's recapitalize the banks, let's have business as usual. Let me just maybe be clear, because I, I think, I think the, 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 the octopus, or whatever you want to call it, of the crony capitalism is very strong. Jamie Dimon, who may or may not end up in jail for, for, for whatever, and he, whose shareholders should throw him out if they had any, any corporate governance issues, he was the lead candidate to become the Secretary of Treasury last summer. Yeah. He was the lead candidate, and um, the president chickened out and decided to, to, to pick someone uh, from Citicorp, Jack Lew, instead. 
who happens to be a much, who is probably you know, not, not nowhere near the level of, of whatever it is, the criminality or, or, or whatever it is, where billions of dollars in your banks you know, are being, being spent. So I, I, uh, I don't see that saying, I don't try sure to understand why the American people are not enraged in, in a way that would have said, let's clean up the banking sector, let's really do this correctly and, and, and make some changes. And, and, but the change I would want to see, so we don't risk getting into this kind of thing, is that we own more of our country and not be owned by this very small number of, of, of billionaires and, you know, et cetera. The 400 or 443 people who's, who own, own, own so much. And it, it, it's, let me phrase it this way. I don't want to take anything that they, away from them that they currently own. We don't need that. It's just as we grow, the share that goes to the rest of us has got to go, rise above 0%. It's got to rise to some, to some reasonable number. We don't even have to squeeze the income distribution in that sense. If we just maintain it and, and we grow, everybody will be better off. But I think the way to do that is through having people have the ownership of capital. Otherwise, you get you get really you got to have workers. You have stronger unions. You got to have a, a system that doesn't seem to be there uh, or develop. Uh, yes, I think we have time for one more. You talk about the people needing to uh, you know maybe the stock to sort of shake them up to you know demand a change. But I saw somewhere that somebody looked at the 250 poorest counties in the United States, and somewhere around 220 of them went from Romney in the last election. Uh, that doesn't necessarily bode well that people are going to act in their own best economic interest. Uh, what, what thoughts do you have about that? Well, we had that previously in U.S. history, you know, after the, uh, uh, after the Civil War. You had poor whites and you had poor blacks. And you had the aristocrat, the southern guys who owned all the land, basically. There were some some states in you know in, in Georgia. There was play, some places there were alignments of the poor whites and the poor blacks. Ultimately, the, the, the racism played a bigger role, or something played a bigger role. And I don't want to be because uh, um, there were promises made to the whites that they wouldn't educate the blacks, and when you know when the, some of the states. So I I think it's it's dividing up poor people on. Other criterion is, is, is very plausible. I had a, 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 a leader of uh, one of these evangelical Christian groups. Okay, one of my students was part of his group, and so we had lunch once at Harvard Square. And got, he said to me, he said, I fully understand, Professor, that, uh, that every policy that we are endorsing is against the economic interests of the poor people we're trying to help you know, get to heaven. Um, and, and I said, well, yes, so why are you doing it? He says, well, you know, it's abortion. It's a whole bunch of the other things that are, are to us more important. And then you sort of say, well, maybe they shouldn't be more important. <laughs> you know, it should, and, we, and we see the, the Pope now is sort of trying, bringing back some of the things, uh, but he hasn't yet you know, discarded some of the Catholic uh, stuff that is not helpful. Uh, um, uh, I think to, to, to having the, the other possibility is just th th this, this, this huge sums of money that goes to propagandizing all of us. And um, this, you know, give me a center, the Freeman Center for Economic Studies with a billion dollars, and I will be telling you a very different story. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask about your concept of inclusive capitalism. Other scholars who use this term are, are referring to new forms of ownership of financial institutions, enterprises, and housing, community, collective forms of ownership. And if for no other reason than Dick say, uh, is, do you endorse this definition of inclusive capitalism as well as stock ownership? Oh, yes. Oh, oh no. It's got to, it, 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 my, my definition of inclusive capitalism is first you get you have some ownership stake in your own company through profit sharing or share ownership. Second, you get paid the same way the CEO gets paid 
in the following sense. If the CEO has a pension, you have a pension. If the CEO has health care, you have health care. And if the CEO has stock options, you have stock options. Um, in, in, our, in our ERISA law, you, know, you don't get tax breaks if you're a company and only give the pensions to the CEO. And I think right across the boards, it should be that everybody gets paid sort of, the CEO is getting more and he'll get proportionally more bigger stock options and so on. But everybody's got to be, in that sense, treated the same. And the way you would do that, you would remove some tax breaks that are currently being, being given. So there's those, there's those things. I am strongly in favor of the pension funds acting more aggressively in, in the governance uh, uh, sphere, which, which ha does have to do with they terrorize pension funds uh, with, with what's the prudential. You've got to be there. You've got to only look out for the prudential you know, decision, which basically means listen to the Wall Street banks. And I think now if I was running a pension fund, I would say, look what the Wall Street banks got. They don't, they, they don't know any more than I do. And if I want to make, let's say, long-term investments that would appear to be lower returns in my community or in some other community, that, that, that you can't tell me you know, that Wall Street's got a deal that I have to buy. And, 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 and so, so there's that a aspect of the savings. And then if it's, if it's a form of, of, of uh, you know, cooperatives, you should all keep your money in credit unions. Uh, I hope Cornell has a wonderful credit union. <laughs> and they offer you better deals, by the way, than the banks, as well as they're not using the money in, 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 in ways that are dangerous to the society. We own the credit unions in some sense. And they were always about 5% five five of the banking system. But they, they, why can't they grow?